this case, the defendant violated the, his conditions of pretrial release, and the judge has, I think, a right for reasonable mm -hmm. control based on the circumstances. Yeah, you know, the, the violation of the bond, though, I mean, you have to weigh, uh, as argued by the defense, the, the, the reason and circumstance and the extent of the violation, I think, that to some degree, in the same way you would if you were just setting bond initially to make a determination as to whether or not there is or might be a violation of the bond conditions and know whether or not there is still a right to bond. I understand that. I understand, you know, uh, the thrust of uh, the, 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 the court rule and the legislative intent about that is to favor release, but setting conditions and as a last resort, then a more strenuous circumstance such as remand or something along that line. I agree, yes. Okay. I, and I think the court's right, and I think Judge Giles did all those things. He he did set a bond. He did modify the bond when the defendant violated the conditions mm -hmm. time and time again, and then he had no recourse but to, to indicate that he's going to treat him like he would treat any other defendant and remand him. And I would submit that's not an abuse of discretion. Had he had the violation just been he missed the deadline, the notification deadline by 20 minutes or 48 hours, and, and uh, notified when he got back, or came to court on Friday and said. Oh, I'm sorry, I went to Canada. An emergency situation. Here's why I went. I'm, I apologize. And Judge Giles went off the handle and said, I'm remanding you because you violated your bond. That would be unreasonable. But that, that's not what we have in this case. We have a series of, of uh, a pattern of events that the defendant violated his bond time and time again by assaulting police officers, interfering with service process. Violating the travel restrictions. I recognize that that's an allegation right yes, now. So I, I mean, you, you, you're taking a prosecutorial stance on it. I recognize that. I'll take a judicial stance on it. So move on. Yes. But, okay. but the biggest thing is he, he felt to disclose it to the court. He misled the court. All right. And as a lawyer, there should be consequences for that. So I think the distinction is, yes, he's entitled to a bond. He had that chance. And he blew it. Okay. But I'm, I'm, I'm still, I, I tell you, and I, I'll be straight up, straight forward with you. That my concern, you know, lies right now in terms of what MCR 6.106 is and what it says and what it's intended to be, and weighing uh, the, the 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 language and the, the of the of the rule and so forth with the circumstances that justify strict remand but nothing else. I understand. That's where I'm having a problem. At. I understand. Okay. And, All right. And, and I think that if this were, like I say, I don't want to go outside the record, but if this were a hearing, there would be. Well, then don't. I'm just saying. Mr. That. Thomas, okay. If you can't contain yourself, you know, get out of here now. I'm not going to stand for you to be interrupting him in the way that you are. You want to respect this courtroom, okay? Objection. I don't have any comment. No, no other comment Objection. about that, okay? Objection. Don't disrespect the process. I'm not. Okay? Oh, you don't make those kind of gratuitous comments, okay? Objection. All right? This is not a court. A, 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 a trial. This is a hearing. Okay. Uh, All right. Please, no, nothing else from you. Okay. Please. Okay. All right. Uh, one more word, you'd be held in contempt. Okay. You don't just disrupt him like that. Please proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I guess uh, our position is that um, Judge Giles did what he felt he had to do under the circumstances because he couldn't get the defendant's attention time and time again. And is that an abuse of discretion? No. Um, did what Judge Giles do the right thing? I submit the court he did because the defendant wasn't compliant. Now he wasn't compliant, but he's being deceitful. Okay. Let me hear from Mr. <clears throat> Parkman or whoever. Judge, can I address at least one issue? I was an attorney of record uh, as it relates to one particular portion of what it was that Mr. Moran has said. Mr. Parkman was not involved. May I at least address the court as it relates to that? You may go ahead, please. But you do it, you know, in a proper way, okay? Get, come to the podium there, okay? Judge, you have right. Okay. Judge, the First Amendment to the bond conditions was not as a result of any wrongdoing that the mayor had done. The mayor had complied in every respect with respect to what Giles, Judge Giles, uh, Judge Humphreys before him, and um, the arraigning magistrate had done. Uh, that bond condition was sua sponte. It was raised out of a concern relating to the notice provisions on the mayor's travel when he was leaving whatever the state or the country. He had been given very broad privileges as it relates to travel. When we appeared in court, it was very clear that it wasn't as a result of any wrongdoing that the mayor had occurred, had done. So this, this, this beginning of the pattern did not start then with Judge Giles uh, entering an opinion that, that changed the bond conditions. We agreed to them and we embraced them, and that was 48 hours' notice. What Mr. Parkman said, and maybe if we had hindsight, we might have uh, fought harder on that, but we did not. And, and so as a result, the conditions were as they are, and that was 48 hours' notice 
only notice as it related to business travel. And we had complied with that for over two months. The court understands the other arguments that Mr. Parkman had made. I don't need to indicate to the court what the law is, but we think that the nature of the judge's response as it relates to this incident, which was not a subsequent incident. He was placed on notice on July the 25th, and he's complied in all respects since the 25th. It was a prior incident. We think that the judge's reaction was exaggerated, and it should not have occurred. And in that, it was an abuse of discretion. All right. You may still speak, Mr. Parkman. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Again, please, the court. Very briefly, I want to say that now that we are on an appeal from that, I do want you, and I know you will, Your Honor, in your wisdom, you'll take a look at the transcript from yesterday. There was very little said about any assault case on an officer, and, in fact, I don't remember any at all. Be that as it may, let me say this. Didn't Judge Jones, you know, mention in his statements he was concerned about things that had occurred? Yes, sir. He may not have made a direct reference in those words. You're correct, Your Honor. I think he was concerned about the various circumstances, you know, that had developed, you know, with your client, you know. You're correct. Since this case, you know, had started. Absolutely correct, Your Honor. Because I think that on page 42 of the transcript. Yes, sir. Judge Jones says, and I quote the second paragraph, in this case, in the beginning of this case, you were given every privilege that could be given to you in regards to travel. It was totally unrestricted initially. After I got this case, I felt that you were abusing that privilege, and I modified it. I said, no, as to personal travel, you have to do like everyone else, motion it up, and as to business travel, just give me four to four hours' notice. And this is what I referenced just a minute ago. Then a week ago, we had a violation for another reason. At that time, I made it perfectly clear, I believe I said to Mr. Parker and Mr. Thomas, don't come back. If I remember right, those are my words. I think that was a somewhat oblique reference to that. Yes, sir. All right. Go ahead. What I want to say about that is that there wasn't a lot on the record, as I mentioned. And I don't want to stand here today and try that issue before you, because I just want to say to you that there is certainly, certainly a difference of opinion about the facts of that case. And we'll get to that later. About the case, the other, the case that's pending? Right. For whatever reason, Your Honor. Let's see, it says 10 over 10 now. That was something supposed to be done at 10 o'clock, so I guess I'm holding up something here. Go ahead. All right. So let me get back to what I believe is the heart of the matter. And I think the court has directed us in its wisdom to the heart of the matter, and that is to the MCR 6106 provisions. As I stood up here and said it was my belief, now I'm even more in my belief that those rules apply in this case, because I do not believe that Mr. Moran has given you any authority otherwise except to say this. And this is where my problem lies, Your Honor. I will quote him. He said, I believe that what Judge Giles did was to try to get his attention. Now listen to me just a minute, please, Your Honor, and I'm through. Go ahead. Listen. Please take a look at MCR 6106. I do not think for one minute that you will find a provision in the law of Michigan that says that getting someone's attention is a reasonable ground to revoke a bond. And if it doesn't say that, then I submit to you, Your Honor, that we are entitled and your wisdom would then control with regards to what type of bond you feel is necessary under these circumstances. Thank you so very much. I appreciate the comment. Since I allowed Mr. Thomas to make some extra other comments, Mr. Moran or the prosecution team here, anything else you want to say, and I'll take a final word on that? One second. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We'll take a brief recess.